You know, you look at this picture, and it's just amazing. This was the golden era of jazz. That photo was the pinnacle of jazz in the 50s. There are all these guys, these famous jazz musicians. Count Basie, Sonny Rollins, and Horace Silver, Dizzy Gillespie, Gene Krupa, Jerry Mulligan, Lester Young, Charles Mingus. Thelonious Monk and Coleman Hawkins. That's a good combination, Monk and, and Hawk. And then there's these uh, two women. But who are they? Hardly anybody knows. There is nothing like the joy of playing music. My name is Clara Bryant. I'm a trumpetiste. Oh yes, it's always, always a surprise to have girl musicians. I'm Viola Smith, I'm a drummer. There were no women with any of the big bands. I was the first one as far as I know. My name is Billy Rogers and I played the trumpet. I played with the greatest female band ever, ever. Hi, I'm Rosalind Perron, and I play alto sax, clarinet, and flute. Well, if you don't feel it, forget it, because you can't play jazz unless you feel it in here. My name is Peggy Gilbert, and I play saxophone. <laughs> it was an, an exciting time. But you always had that one thing to confront you. The agent would come up to me and say, we can't use that girl. She's, uh, you got to get somebody that looks better. And don't forget to smile at the women. How could you smile with a horn in your mouth? I did get a call from the Ada Leonard Orchestra, which was rehearsing and going to open at the Oriental Theater in Chicago. And I said, yes, yes, and I was so, so excited. After some rehearsals that week, we were shown our costume. And out comes this god-awful pink thing with flounces, and, and it had all these flares and, and pink ruffles, and I was mortified. I'm a professional. <laughs> I wear a skirt and a sweater or a blouse, a white blouse with a little black tie. I don't wear pink ruffles. And I, I hated that gown with a passion. Females were not looked on in the same, with the same attitude, shall we use the word attitude, as male musicians were. Well, most of them treated us as novelties. It was unusual, and people thought it was cute, you know. On our first show, when the curtain went up, the audience went insane. They were clapping and stomping and carrying on and whistling. We hadn't really played much. <laughs> We'd only played a couple of notes. And so after it died down and then an act came on, I sort of whispered to the girl next to me, why the big reception? And she told me, well, Ada was a striptease artist. Well, I thought that was hilarious. It was a lot of fun. The fun lasted until we started doing One Nighters uh, in the South. Anna Mae mentioned something to the effect that we're going to Jim Crow country. I'd been in the South with Ada Leonard. Nobody had mentioned this man's name. 
And of course, I had never met him, so I guess I'm going to meet him now. And then I learned that Jim Crow is a set of laws that was set up to keep black people as far removed from whites as, as humanly possible. They wouldn't stand for us mixing. I was dying to get hold of a little girl one time that was a trumpet player, and she was just great. And I wanted to put her in the band, you know. And they said, we can't do it because there are a lot of people that would object to a mixed racial band. I feel so lonesome. I don't know what to do. Well, traveling through the South is something you really would like to forget. Some of the experiences you had, you know, like we'd pull into a service station and the guy would come out with his gun and say, we don't, we don't have any black toilets. You niggas go out in the, in the field and squat. The band had its own bus, upper and lower berths like a Pullman car. And that was our home on wheels. Had a little bathroom in the back. There was a great danger for the band, for everybody in the band, for our bus driver. We all found it was much easier if I just stayed in very dangerous places in the bus. And I also remember some places they would accept you, some places didn't have room for you, you know. We didn't sleep on the bus, we wouldn't have a place to stay. We played theaters, we played dance halls. If we were in a theater, the white folks would be downstairs and the ropes would be dividing the blacks and the whites. Everything was segregated, everything. There could be no fraternization between the races. The problems of traveling in the South were the same for male bands as they were for female bands. But the women had it a lot rougher just because they were women. There were always a group of women who would open their homes to traveling musicians, and they were saints. There was never a question that I couldn't stay in their homes, even though it was putting them in grave danger, real jeopardy. There were times on bandstands when it became pretty tricky because I was right there in the front row playing alto. There was no way to hide my face. Well, in those days, there were a lot of bedroom integration. And there were a lot of black girls that had white parents, you know what I mean? See, so they were so, yeah, I'm black. Uh, my, mother's, my mother's black. You want to sit? And they said, no, we don't want to go see your mother. We want to know you know, what nationality you are, you know. Mrs. Jones thought that possibly they, the girls could come up with a way to either darken my skin or make it a, a shade that, that, that uh, would be, not be off-putting to sheriffs who were sniffing around trying to determine whether I was white or not. Uh, and we tried different uh, face powders and it really, it, it, I just turned orange for the most part. See, we had so many mixed girls in the band. The police came, you know, and he says to my, uh, my husband's manager at that time, he says, you have white girls in this band. And my husband said, well, if you can pick out the one that's white, then you arrest them. And the one that he picked out was the mulatto. You know, <laughs> he never did pick out the white ones, you know. Yes, I feel so lonely. Soon we're heading back to the Williams house for sweet potato pie. We get lots of hugs from Mrs. Williams and a bag of food for each of us. As we climb aboard the bus, she calls, bye, children. You all take care of each other and we'll pray to the good Lord to look after you. I reach out through the open bus window, grab Mrs. Williams' hand and say, I know how much courage it took for you to take me into your home and I will never forget you. And I've not forgotten. <laughs> Those were rough days. Rough times, scary times. I was surrounded by the girls with so much love, and then so many times I felt so embarrassed for my race, so humiliated by them. I wanted to lash out at them, and of course I couldn't. <laughs> 